I'm not gonna like it, am I? You don't like anything. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in The Bad Batch, Episode 8, Bad Territory. This episode gave us a Star Wars environment that we've never seen before, toxic Louisiana, and teased a really big mystery. Who is Fennec Shan talking to? Is she betraying The Bad Batch? What is her agenda? I have some theories on that mystery bounty hunter that I'm going to talk about a little later in the video. But first, I want to remind you guys that we have designed this new Star Wars parody merch at our merch store, ScreenCrushMerch.com. There is the Somehow Palpatine Return, the Spice Krispies Dune Shirt, The Apprentice Lives, Original trilogy prequel apologist hello there and my favorite mando and grogu is et and elliot plus many more just click on our far far away collection to find it shopping our merch store is the best way to support us so we can keep making videos like this and thank you guys for watching so the episode is called bad territory which has a pretty obvious meaning wrecker fennec and hunter enter a planet with toxic atmosphere filled with sea mines and deadly monsters but i also liked how these two storylines in the episode mirrored each other hunter and the others know that the empire is hunting down omega because of something called the m count in her blood now, we know what M-Count is. We first heard the term in The Mandalorian in reference to Grogu's blood. I highly doubt we'll find a donor with a higher M-Count, though. And later, Moff Gideon says, it has been blessed with rare properties that have the potential to bring order back to the galaxy. And it turned out that what Gideon really wanted to do was create four sensitive clones of himself. So all of this adds up to the M count being a shorthand for midi-chlorian count. And actually, I'm still amazed that so much of Star Wars is about four sensitive DNA. Why? What's so amazing about that? Well, because from like 1977 to 1999, the force was exclusively an energy field that was nebulous and unexplainable. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us, and penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. And that meant that you can interpret the Force however you want it. But then in 1999, George Lucas gave the Force a scientific explanation. The Dechlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. Which made the Force into something that you could control and harness with genetics. Fans hated this, and we never heard the term midi-chlorians in the movies again. But now, because the Emperor was resurrected with a couple lines in The Rise of Skywalker, Dark science. Cloning. Secrets only the Sith knew. New Star Wars projects are forced to explore this idea. We heard Project Necromancer get referenced by the Imperial Shadow Council in The Mandalorian. And provide Commandant Huts enough time to deliver on Project Necromancer. And of course, the show The Bad Batch is showing the Emperor's secret cloning facility on Mount Tantus. To be honest, I'm all for this because I think shows like The Mandalorian and The Bad Batch can make The Rise of Skywalker better with additional context, much like how the Clone Wars series improved the prequels and the relationship between Anakin and Padme by providing additional context for Anakin's fall to the dark side. So, like I said, this episode has two parallel stories. In one, Hunter and Wrecker are trying to find someone to tell them what M count means, while in the other storyline, Omega is showing Crosshair what an M count means by helping him to achieve balance through meditation. Whether Omega knows it or not, this is actually helping him to harmonize with the Force. You know, it's been interesting to see the Bad Batch coping without tech for this whole season because he was always the guy who could just solve their problems. So now we have to see everyone else catch up and learn to play at the top of their own intelligence. And that's really what the Bad Batch is about, showing how you can improve and grow over time. Yeah, but like, like tech stuff, like math and science, oh, that's so hard because I'm just a little dog. Well, you're not wrong. Math and science are hard, but learning hard subjects makes you better at problem solving in real life. You know, like I was a terrible math student in school, but I've always been curious about math and science, and I know that those principles can make me better at my job and just in everyday life. And after graduating, I never thought that I'd have a chance to learn those skills, but now I spend about 15 minutes a day doing math and science lessons to sharpen my brain with Brilliant. They're the sponsor of this video. Brilliant helps you to learn something new every day, like science, computer science, or math, or multiple other concepts. You can learn to understand big things like terraforming Mars or regular household items like how cell phones work. Heck, this lesson even made me a better pool player. But what's key here is that Brilliant builds your understanding with hands-on problem solving. And this kind of method is proven to work six times better than just watching lecture videos online. These lessons let you play with these concepts from the ground up. Plus, the lessons were created by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. I'm something of a scientist myself. Like, the reason I struggled in school so much was because school is so focused on memorizing and not learning, but Brilliant teaches you these concepts through problem solving. So, while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also learn 
learn to become a better thinker. Yeah, but I bet all that stuff takes forever. Not at all. Brilliant cultivates a simple daily learning habit. You don't get burned out because the lessons are short, simple, and fun. It's the opposite of doom scrolling on your phone. Plus, Brilliant has just launched new featured content that has helped me a lot in my job. They have lessons in how to examine data and modeling with multiple variables. And I am telling you, when you run a YouTube channel, you have a lot of data to sort through. Brilliant has made me better at my job with these short, fun lessons. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash screen crush or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription, which I highly recommend. Now back to the Bad Batch. So we begin on Pabu, AKA Space Grease, where Omega is staring at her comm to manifest her survivor's guilt. He and Rex lost most of their squad in that attack. All because the Empire was after me. Obviously, that comm is the same model used by the heroes in A New Hope. But more importantly, this scene lays down Omega's arc for this episode. She feels terrible that people are dying because of her. Now, she does want to help Crosshair, but by helping him to find balance and meditate, she's also helping herself. So now that it's been basically confirmed that Omega is Force-sensitive, like we theorized all the way back in our breakdown of Episode 1, the question becomes, what is Omega's special gift? The High Republic novels show us that many Jedi have a kind of specialty. Some, like Anakin and Mace Windu, are gifted warriors. Others, like Obi-Wan, have the gift of sarcasm. Oh, this is going to be easy. And Cal Kestis, Rey, and Quinlan Voss can, like, sense echoes in the forest, Leia flies like Mary Poppins. You get the idea. I think Omega's gift is emotional empathy. All the way back in episode one, she was able to sense crosshairs in her conflict. It's not your fault. Now, if she were to be trained as a Jedi, she would probably be more specialized at telepathy and the Jedi mind trick. And she flexes those skills in this episode, getting through to Crosshair to help him deal with his trauma. And then they're contacted by Fee Genoa, voiced by the great Wanda Sykes. I've been asking around about this M count thing. Fee was introduced last season to take the Bad Batch on some of their best missions, like the one where they break into a Zepho temple and uncover a robot kaiju. She's also the person who introduced the Batch to Pabu and is probably the only person that they can actually trust. And the way Omega describes her, she's a liberator of ancient wonders, is how she describes herself in her first episode. I prefer liberator of ancient wonders. She says, Word is. Certain class one bounty hunters have been retrieving M count targets for the Empire. Now, by class one bounty hunters, I assume she means people like Cad Bane and Boba Fett, while lower class bounty hunters would be like Toro in The Mandalorian. How long have you been with the guild? Long enough. Clearly not. Now, it's interesting she says that the Empire has hired bounty hunters to acquire M-count targets because we have seen a history of this in every era of Star Wars. In the Clone Wars, Darth Sidious hired Cad Bane to kidnap infants who were strong in the Force. We see the Sith Inquisitors do the same thing in Star Wars Rebels, and of course, Moff Gideon went after Grogu in The Mandalorian. Now, I always assumed that Palpatine just wanted Force-sensitive kids so he could either kill them or raise them up to be brainwashed Sith Inquisitors. But it turns out that the answer is even more screwed up than that. He wanted to gather these babies to harvest their organs. Ew. Yeah, and it's kind of the perfect goal for a Sith. You see, the dark side of the Force is not inherently evil. It's actually natural. It's death, which gives way to life, balance of the Force, circle of life, and all that. But the Sith use the dark side in an unnatural way. They harness the dark side of the Force to use it for unnatural means. Now, we've seen how the dark side decays Palpatine's flesh. So he's actually kind of like a vampire, feeding off the young and healthy to keep himself alive. He even steals Rey and Kylo's life force in Rise of Skywalker to rejuvenate his cloned body. Now, there's a run gag this episode where Crosshair keeps asking who because he hasn't been around for so long he needs everything explained to him which makes him an audience proxy what do you mean by that well he's the character that you can explain everything to to make exposition more palatable for the audience so then they work out that they should go talk to Fennec Shand now who is that again well remember Fennec Shand is the bounty hunter that we first saw in the Mandalorian season one Din Djarin helped Toro hunt her down in the deserts of Tatooine and then they left her for dead afterwards she was rescued by Boba Fett and then Thundercat gave her cybernetic implants but 25 years before all that happened, she was hired by Nala Se to capture Omega to protect her from the Empire. Fennec Shand is played by the amazing Ming-Na Wen, the original Mulan, and Mayday from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hunter notices Crosshair's handshaking because he's got those advanced senses, you know, which leads to the episode's B-plot, Omega helping Crosshair to find inner peace to manage his PTSD. And I gotta say, this show works really well when it runs parallel plots like this, instead of like slogging through a single storyline. They land on this gritty space station, and right away, I love how a single frame 
team here can tell an entire story. We've got this weird little astromech droid, like a combination between R2-D2 and Robbie the Robot from Lost in Space. On the left, there's this shady person who is a kid doing lookout for him, like a drug dealer training a kid to sell death sticks. Which reminds me of one of my favorite shirts in our merch store, say no to death sticks, go home, rethink your life. You want to go home and rethink your life? I want to go home and rethink my life. This place is dirty with trash everywhere, and yet the screens are bright and new, telling you that there is some money to be gained in this place, but there is a huge split between the upper and lower classes. Not to mention the steam rising from the place, like the station is just resting somewhere in hell, barely keeping back the flames. On the right-hand side, we can also see one of the pit droids from The Phantom Menace, an astromech at the bottom, an RA-7 protocol droid in the center, and there's also this very 80s looking guy with a mullet in the bottom right. Okay, I don't know what that's about. And right here, we see an Arcona, the first alien to appear in the Mos Eisley Cantina. I mean, guys, I've been watching Clone Wars since 2008, and it is amazing how much more advanced this animation is. Really incredible work on just a short little background shot. Now, in the next shot, we even see a guy in the corner who looks like he's a junkie. Now, this is perfect for Star Wars, where there's always a story or an adventure lurking around every corner. Outside the bar, we see a Bith having a rough night and... Just inside the bar, we see a Godel with another Arcona at the other end of the bar. And there's a Pantoran server. And notice the modified pit droid who is bartending. Now, this bar has a droid bartender and droid bouncers. This tells us a lot about this joint. Following the Clone Wars, there was a lot of galaxy-wide resentment against droids, especially on former Republic world. We don't serve their kind here. <laughs> what? You're droids. They'll have to wait outside. So, if a bar does not discriminate against droids, it was probably a former separatist world, meaning that the Empire would not be as strong or as centralized at this location. There's actually a lot of arabesh in this bar and throughout the episode that I'm going to go over a little bit later in the video. I will say, though, that the bottles over the bar are the exact same ones that we see over Sid's bar on Org Mantel. Also, the droid bouncer is the same model that ran the droid crime syndicate that we saw in the Season 2 episode, Tribe. And notice here we see an Aqualish, guys who are always starting fights in Star Wars bars. <laughs> Sure enough, the Aqualish gets in a fight with a Pantoran a few seconds later. <laughs> Now this is an easy way to show that this is a tough place. No one blinks an eye when someone gets shot. Now we of course saw this in the original Star Wars, but also this is an old trope dating back to westerns. <laughs> Finnick is talking to a Rodian at a table, and I, I love writing like this. That's a for me. That's non-negotiable. I love when we get just a small snippet of a larger story, and then we have to fill in the rest. Who does this Rodian have beef with? A business partner? A guy who had sex with his wife? Is it a gigolo? The Rodian kills a gigolo everywhere he goes. Finnick works out a deal where they have to help her with a bounty, getting an insectoid target named Silar. Now, I've always loved Finnick Shan's ship, but Star Wars has never given it an official name or ship class. But it's cool how it has a large cargo hold for bounties, just like Din Djarin's ship, the Razor Crest. Finnick says, Took out a couple of top bosses for the Haxian Brood and escaped with a cache of credits. Now, the Haxian Brood were a huge crime syndicate during this era. Cal Kestis and the Mantis crew ran afoul of them in the Fallen Order games, and the syndicate hunted them down in both games and in the novel Battle Scars. Notice the pit droids scurrying around the hangar when they land, similar to the pit droids that worked for Pele Motto in The Mandalorian. My favorite bit of this whole scene was watching the droid negotiate a price with Fennec. He shows her the data pad as if to say, look, look, that's how much it costs. It's out of my hands. So, welcome to the space bayou where the air is poisonous. And actually, I think we should see a lot more planets with poisonous air. It would make sense if more planets had like different atmospheres. It's an alien planet! Is there air? You don't know! But I suspect the only reason this one was poisonous was so that the heroes could keep on their helmets the entire time. The poisonous air never really does figure into this mission. And you know what? This is a lot like Louisiana with like the swamp and the hovercraft and the gators, but it's also reminded me a little bit of Apocalypse Now. I couldn't believe they wanted this man dead. Third generation West Point, top of his class. Hunter uses his enhanced senses to spot a mine, and when Hunter and Wrecker go underwater to disable the mines, I just want to shout out how gorgeous the animation is here. Now, this whole sequence where they slowly disabled the mines one at a time really made me anxious, and for a while I couldn't figure out why. And then I realized it was reminding me of the dam level in the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Nintendo game. It was so freaking hard. Now, back on Pabu, we see the Crosshair isn't just having a problem with his hand, he's having a problem with his purpose. He was literally designed to snipe. That is his purpose. Beach. Nope, you're not even beach. But if his hand shakes, if he loses his resolve, then he loses his purpose for living. Now, we already saw Hunter and the others go through this last season. If the warriors don't have a war, what can they do? Where can they be safe? What's next? And now Crosshair has to grapple with these same issues. Back on the bayou, the gators attack. 
Finnick fights them off with her modified MK sniper rifle, just like the one we first saw her use in The Mandalorian. Afterwards, Finnick opens up a bit and tells the Bad Batch that Nala Say hired her to keep Omega away from the Empire. I let her go when the bounty was called off. Now, this is actually a small but important piece of information for them to know. It tells them that Nala Say has never wanted Omega to be near the Empire, which means that Nala Say always knew that Omega was special because she was designed that way. So when they find out what an M count is, they'll now be able to work out that Omega was designed to essentially become a Jedi. And I will say though, it's kind of a drag watching characters work out information that we already know. If they find out next episode, then that'll be three episodes in a row of the Bad Batch trying to find out something that the audience already understands. Now I like how Silar's hut kind of looks like an insect nest and how his natural defense mechanism was to spit venom onto Wrecker. Now at first I was wondering why Finnick didn't just shoot him from far away, but this actually makes total sense. She needs the higher bounty by bringing him in alive. And stun shots are not as effective at a distance. And then they do take him down, but it takes like several stun shots. <laughs> And I think this is because, as an insect, Silar has a very thick exoskeleton. Back on Pabu, Omega shows Crosshair how to meditate. Where did you learn this? I picked it up from my friend Gunji and the other Wookiees on Kashyyyk. Now, Gungi, you'll remember, was a youngling Jedi that we met in a terrific Clone Wars arc. A Wookiee? Rare you are to the Jedi. Proud your people must be. And David Tennant's Hu Yang helped him build his lightsaber. Ah, mm. oh, yes, wood. Last season, the Bad Batch helped Gungi return to Kashyyyk, where they fought off Trandoshans together. And like Omega says, in that episode, Gungi taught her how to meditate. Now, whether Omega realizes it or not, this was also helping her to connect to the Force. And this meditation shot is very similar to the epic shot of Luke Skywalker astral projecting his image from Acto. And you know what? When I was a kid, I just wanted to visit like adventurous places that were rough, like Tatooine or Jabba's Palace or the lower levels of Coruscant. But now that I'm an adult, I just want to meditate with Omega at Space Grease. So Finnick leaves them hanging, promising she'll deliver information later, and then she talks to a mysterious unseen figure. Sure you can track them down easily enough. I'll send you what I have. Yeah, who was she talking to? Well, definitely another bounty hunter, but let me throw out a couple possibilities. One, it could have been Cad Bane. Cad Bane took a contract from the Empire to hunt down Omega. Kidnapping innocent children. Seems like a small time crime for the likes of you. He's tracked down several force sensitive babies before in the Clone Wars, so he would be on the M count job. And he and Finnick have crossed paths in season one, so we know that they know each other. Finnick Shand. Hello, Bane. And if Phoenix Sham was going to sell this information about where to find the Bad Batch to a bounty hunter, she could sell it to Cad Bane. You of all people know it's all about the price. But an appearance by Cad Bane is only that, an appearance by Cad Bane. So I have a stronger theory on who this could be, but first, let's translate some Arabesh. Finnick is apparently in the VIP lounge, and in this shot, we can see sale written beneath VIP lounge. In this shot, the word C-O-R-P is mirrored, and the bottle reads thermal detonator, also a liquor that we've seen for sale at SIDS that is kind of shaped like a thermal detonator. Okay, enough of the made-up Star Wars language. Our languages are made up. I think that Finnick Shan here was actually talking to young Boba Fett. Now this fits for a few reasons. One, we already know that Boba Fett was an established bounty hunter at this point. We saw him operating as a tween during the Clone Wars. This is your boss. You got a problem with that? My name's Boba. And in the Clone Wars, he formed his own bounty hunter syndicate, showing that he was always a leader who would make connections within his own field. But also, Boba Fett saves Fennec Shan's life 20 years after this. Maybe that was just professional courtesy, or maybe he did it because he too almost died in the desert. But I think it makes more sense if he knew her from back in the day. Otherwise, why bother taking a dying woman to get robot guts from Thundercat? Now, in the book of Boba Fett, she does ask who he is. I am Boba Fett. Boba is dead. But notice she replies that Boba Fett is dead, which would mean that she could have known Boba Fett and assumed that this guy was just another clone. Also, if Fennec Shand is telling Boba Fett about Omega and the Bad Batch, but then Boba Fett doesn't turn them in, it shows that they already have a mutual trust and respect. Now, Boba Fett would also be fitting because he is the only unaltered clone of Jango Fett. Fett demanded only one thing, an unaltered clone for himself. We learned in episode one that Boba's designation was Clone Alpha, the first, while Omega's name symbolized that she is the final, most advanced clone. So it would bring this series full circle to have Boba Fett meet his sister, Omega. My name's Boba. Hello. And maybe Boba would not only know about the M count, but he would know specifically that Nala Se was trying to create a Force-sensitive clone. After all, Boba and Omega both grew up together on Topoka City. Well, guys, that's all the Easter eggs we found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.